Well, first of all, I want to thank you guys to our uh, first Citizens Advisory Committee meeting. I appreciate all of you putting in your applications. And for those that might be listening that applied, please pay attention because in the future, a lot of folks that applied will have the opportunity to serve in this regard. A couple things you should know if you're going to be speaking and a lot of you will be sharing the mic, it's really easy. You push the button down and it turns green and you can talk. But, but the big thing is once you're done, you want to push it. And The, the big thing is, is it's going to be important because this is a recorded meeting and it's going to come through a lot clearer if you hit the green button when you talk. So with that being said, uh, first of all, I would like to um, personally hand out these pins to each of you for your representation. Oh, I know I'm going to give you another one. Okay. All right. So, wrote down a couple notes here I want to pull up. So about, I think it was, it was before I was in council, so it was about seven years ago, um, the former council had approved this and I was one of the first people who was part of that first Citizens Advisory Committee. So you guys might, it might be a good thing or a bad thing or a scary thing that, <laughs> you could very well be doing this conversation that I'm doing today. But it, uh, it was something that was really great. Because I was part of it, I got to see what worked and what didn't. And in a lot of cases, it turned out to be something where information, the idea was to provide information to be a conduit between the neighborhoods, but we had a lot of people that just wanted a sidewalk in front of their house replaced and things like that. This group isn't that. This group is to Find out what the concerns of your neighborhood are and holistically what your concerns of the city are. And um, you're going you're gonna to hear some, you're going to get homework today, and uh, we've got some other things. But it's important that you remember a couple things. You're gonna be a, you are going to be a conduit of information. So a lot of things, we're going to try to educate you on some of the things, and then um, part of our, what we battle all the time is misinformation, candidly. We want to give you the best information we can so you can correctly communicate to folks. But it's also one of those things where you don't have to be the, the only messenger to the city. We don't want to do that so much. We want you to be able to have the information, inform people, but they're still, please welcome to contact the city council or reach out to Bonnie or whatever for information should they not know something. Um, but we enc I encourage all of you, if you can, and many of you do, watch the city council meetings as much as possible so you're in tune with what's going on. If you can't be at a meeting, which is fine, it's recorded on YouTube, it's very easy, or you can get it at the website. Um, there, there's a, there's a, a lot of the feedback we're gonna get is, it, it's gonna be incorporated, so we're gonna capture the information and it's gonna be sent to the staff, the council, and you guys as well and it'll be incorporated in our budget and our future plans. It'll be f incorporated in our CIPs and all kinds of other things. So a lot of what you say might not immediately happen, but might happen over the next few years, right? And we're looking for consensuses and things like that, but we wanna hear each of your independent voices. Um, there's no voting here on privileges or things like that. Everybody is an equal member in this regard. And uh, we wanna hear from all of you. What you might think is important might not be what somebody over here thinks is important. But we have a great collection of neighborhoods and businesses and marine attendants. Um, I will say that be open to seeing the bigger picture. There's a lot of things where it's on the surface may seem like it's an answer, like you have, you can't understand something or why. But the idea here is to get 
the full spectrum of the story so you can understand it. it's something each of us as council members are challenged to do is we just don't get to walk in our shoes we have to walk in a lot of people's shoes so I encourage you to think think that way um, and again like I said when people have needs you contact them they're like well we've got these potholes on 16th or whatever or this we need police or whatever I encourage you have them write an email send it to the City Council and staffs or fill out the reports on the website so they can be addressed right what you don't want to be is this collection of list of Joe neighbor says this and we need to do that and Linda says this and that it's refer them back and teach them how to use the tools to communicate you're more inform informative but you don't want to be that liaison nor should you be um, the uh, the one thing that I'm committed to and the council is I'll have I'm going to give you a state of the city and I've got this introduction and I'll be present at the meetings because I'm the presiding officer for it but I'm going to do my best to stay out of the way one of the things that as a council member we can chat we can tend to be too defensive on what we've done now we have our reasons that we've worked really hard like all of you guys in the community but one of the things I want to do is make sure I'm not if, if what I'm going to be available for is if you have questions that I can answer or staff can answer we will do our best to do so but the idea is that's my commitment to you is to try to stay out of the way and along with the guarantee of of other council members it's other we're non-participatory in this other than facilitating the meeting we want to hear from you and that comes back to the council as a whole for people to see what's important and what are the priorities um, I encourage you not only you've all met a lot of your neighbors and I chose a lot of you because you know a lot of people in the community but I encourage you to meet the ones you haven't met yet in any opportunity you can when you're walking your neighborhood and you see somebody else, oh you live here introduce yourself right get conversation solicit as many voices if you know anything about a lot of us in, on council is we try to make ourselves as accessible as possible all over the place and I encourage you to do so um, the other thing is is if you do have questions don't hesitate to contact myself or other council members or um, an email to to the staff that if you have a like you get, ran into somebody that you don't have an answer for we want to try to find a way to support you and get that answer if you don't know what it is um, anyway with that I'm really excited because we, the, what what we've done is we've decided to hide hire a facilitator instead instead of myself instead of me facilitating the meeting like our former mayor used to do and not that there's anything wrong with that the idea is that we wanted somebody that doesn't have uh, skin in the game you might say other than doing that so Jenny here is I'm gonna have you introduce yourself and take take it over with the introduction piece sure thank you Matt. Um, well, you welcome. Oh, yeah. How close do I have to be to this thing? That, that, that Should be okay. Yeah. Um, my name is Jenny Folia Jones, and I've been hired by the city to facilitate uh, the Citizens Advisory Committee. So thank you, and I look forward to working with you guys. Um, a little bit of background about me is uh, I've previously worked for about 15 years with different uh, Citizens Advisory Committee groups um, in different capacities, and so. Um, I'm looking forward to, to working with Des Moines, and I have not worked with Des Moines yet, so it's exciting to get to know this community. Um, I, uh, I'm gonna ask you guys to introduce yourself, so we're gonna go around, so get ready. I've got a series of things that I want you to prep, okay? So I want just names, of course we can see them, and your neighborhoods, but I'd like you to introduce yourself. Um, so name, neighborhood. I'd like you to also say, you know, why did you wanna join this, the committee? And then a fun fact about yourself. So something fun and interesting. So something fun and interesting um, about me would be that uh, I coached cheerleading for many, many years. And uh, my team won a, a state division title for um, co-ed many years ago. But anyway, so fun fact, just something unusual that has nothing to do with this job that I do now. So anyway, um, let's go this way. We'll start here. I know you're going to hear from him here in a little bit, but we'll start with you. Fun fact. Well, first, Ken Thomas, the police chief. <laughs> the whole city's my neighborhood, <laughs> but I've kind of adopted Redondo a little bit. Um, let's see. Fun fact. 
Uh, I've got a boat and I like to take it down to the marina every chance that Scott will let me in. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Ryan Bowering. Uh, I'm new to the committee and I live on North Hill. Um, bought my house about two years ago. Uh, I'm interested in being on the committee um, for a general interest in local government. I work for King County um, and it's just always been something that I've wanted to, this has always been something that I've wanted to do. I just hadn't been, I hadn't had roots. Um, so yeah, that's why I'm here. And a uh, fun fact about me, I'm originally from Eastern Canada from a little tiny village in a very rural island uh, far away from rural. everything. My name is Morgan Hicks, and I'm a resident of North Hill as well. I've been there 20 years. That's uh, not a long time compared to some residents. However, I own the yarn store down in the Marina District, and a lot of you know me from that location, that place. Pretty central, lots of people walk through. It's sort of like cheers for <laughs> the hand workers, and we do have people that settle in after about 1.30, after the lunch crowd is gone. and. Uh, a fun fact about me is I'm learning Greek in my spare time. <laughs> That's about as fun as I get these days. <laughs> well, I'm Doug Andrews, and <clears throat> marina tenant. I kind of into boats. Uh, one fact maybe is that I started the first grade in Des Moines Elementary School, and I'm almost 78 years old, so it gives you an idea how long I've been around Des Moines. And I was raised on the, my folks moved to the property that Wesley Terrace is on. And I lived there through my grade school, junior high, and then my folks sold the property to the Methodist Church. And that's kind of where I was, I was raised. And I've had a boat in the marina for over 30 years, so that's kind of my interest. Elizabeth? Yep, oh, 70 something years to get to be here for another hour. Uh, my, my name is Patricia Mendoza, I'm originally from Chile. I moved to this country 32 years ago to the city of Des Moines. So I've been, since I came to this country, I've been in Des Moines. And a business owner that I closed uh, my shop, but not my business, my office in Des Moines because of COVID. So I'm working from home right now, but I had a business for the last 25 years in the Moines called Easy Computer. Um, <clears throat> something fun about me, I have five kids. Uh, it's great to be a father, I love them. And I, the best thing that happened to me is to be a dad. So um, that's my fun part. Uh, running for city council one time, long time ago. I was part of this same group seven years ago with Matt. Actually, we were together in the first one. And, um, it was a lot of good learning from there, and I had the same inspiration that Matt ran for city council. The only difference, he was elected. I wasn't elected. But uh, the experience and the learning was good. You learn to serve the city, to try to be a support for the city, and that's my goal. I come as a backup for the head of the South Seattle, Des Moines, going to be Magna. So if that's the far you got going to hear from me, pretty much you want to hear from her. So anyway, that's me. Hi, I'm Mackenzie Myers, and I kind of fell in love with Des Moines when I started working at the quarter deck and um, being down at the marina and the community, so I decided to move here. And then um, just recently took over the quarter deck, so that's been fun, and I just love the community. So I'm excited to learn a lot and be part of this. And uh, fun fact about me, I started meeting a lot of people when I actually started dog walking for a lot of people in Des Moines. So that's been really fun. And then, yeah. yeah. I'm Daniel. I'm from uh, representing North Central. My, my wife and I bought in 2016, or 2015 actually. Uh, and I just totally spaced on what, you, what the questions were. <laughs> Yeah, I wanted to join because I love this. I love this city, and I want to learn how I can serve it and love it well. Uh, fun fact about me: I love tacos, <laughs> so I just made shrimp, chicken, and bacon tacos tonight. And uh, I did, yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
Hello, everyone. My name is Magda, and I lived in Des Moines for 22 years in the same house by the new Des Moines Elementary. And I represent South Des Moines. Thank you, Patricio, for the invitation. Uh, and why? Same, same reason. I love the city. I love Des Moines. I um, fell in love with it 22 years ago. I lived in Burien before and then here. Um, been in the States for 24 years. 24 years, and 22 have been in the morning. And I couldn't think of a fun fact, but now with the tacos idea, <laughs> and then I lost it again. Uh, gosh, I can't remember. But um, I'm originally from Mexico, from Guadalajara, and we, I make really good tacos. Nice. That's my fun fact. Uh huh. Good one. Hi, I'm Charlotte also, and I represent my neighborhood, that is the Marina neighborhood. Uh, I, my reason for joining is that I really have always wanted to be um, a good citizen, and I come from a family that were always volunteering for their city and made a difference. And I think it's really interesting always to know where we're headed and what we're doing, and, and we have such a gem here in Des Moines, so I'm happy to be part of that. Uh, fun fact, well, for fun, it's wine, especially at the quarter deck, <laughs> because I usually meet with my adult children, and, and we tend to have a, a really good time there. So, thank you. Hi, I'm Stephanie. Um, I'm in Zenith, but I'm a partner to Lloyd. Um, I wanted to join because um, I feel like, so I grew up in Burien also, but we launched our boat at the marina in 1993 and only pulled it out in 2018. So um, I feel like Des Moines has been like a second home always. And uh, growing up as a child in Des Moines, I think there's a lot more kids stuff. And now as a parent of children in Des Moines, I feel like there's not enough. So I'm here for that. Um, I don't know if I really have a fun fact. So I'll pass it on. <laughs> Uh, hi, I'm Victoria Andrews. I'm uh, representing the Marina District. I've lived in Des Moines since 2004 and down in the Marina area since 2009. I walk it every day. I know all the dogs. I know most of the people by name. Um, I wanted to join because um, I've always been a volunteer too. Was kind of shut down with COVID and so started doing storm drain markers and now graffiti removal, although there hasn't been any. I have yet to get a call. Um, but I am very concerned about the redevelopment of the marina and I want it to be done sensibly and I want it to be done affordably and I want it to protect what's down there. Uh, so this is my chance to use my, my voice if I can. Uh, fun fact, I grew up in Bangor, Maine, and yet I was 22 years old before I had my first lobster. I was so embarrassed. <laughs>
Hi everybody, my name is Bex Savel and I am also a recent uh, resident, so it's really nice to meet all of you that have been here for a long time. I grew up in California and during grad school, I got into government stuff working with my city council in the Central Valley to help out our community because we are a young college town like UC Merced, I don't know if you guys heard of it. Um, so that is where I guess my, my little passion about government started at because I was able to work and help and try to bring issues from like the student perspective. And so when I moved here and I'm planning to be here for a long time, <laughs> I figure, you know, I can then continue that work and that passion and, and get to connect with more people. So I feel like I'm also using that opportunity to get to meet more, more people. Um, I would say a fun fact for me is I've been learning how to play the violin, so I do mm. apologize if you ever drive by my house. I <laughs> hope that uh, the airplane noise like hides it, but um, yeah, thank you. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Chuck Coleman. I'm originally from South Carolina, um, spent time in Houston, Kansas City, and recently in Las Vegas for 28 years. Um, Retired about two years ago uh, as a real estate uh, construction manager, managing projects all over the country, all over the world. Um, very fortunate career that I've had. Uh, my wife and I uh, moved up here about, realistically, about four years ago. And the reason I joined is we both believe in when we leave a place, we leave it in better shape than it was when we got here. I care about the community I live in. Um, care about all the people and want to make it better. Fun fact, I'm a pilot, been pilot for 48 years, had these two competing careers in real estate and aviation my whole life and they both, uh, they both compete with each other. Are you a Gemini? No. <laughs> no. Uh, good evening, my name is Randy Williams. Uh, Yes, we're in Woodmont is what we're going to be calling it now. Uh, it's, uh, it's kind of a wide area. We're just above the uh, Redondo territory. In fact, I'm only two doors down from Fire Station 66. So we're right in that neck of the woods. And I bought the helicopter a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a little strange. But uh, I'm a retired U.S. Coast Guard Marine Science Technician. Been a working science diver. Been diving for 54 years. Uh, I do spend a lot of my time volunteering and working with the Marine Science and Technology Center in Redondo. Um, been an instructor for a long time. I'm also vice president of the Washington Scuba Alliance, which we do a lot of underwater cleanups. We built the big rock reef at Saltwater State Park, for example, working with state parks. And uh, nice thing about working at the, uh, the Mass Center, I have video of him underwater in a full face mass chasing squid. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's a good one, actually. So, yeah, all the years I've been working in marine science, oceanography background. So, my wife, by the way, just to confuse everyone, her name is also Randy. Mm -hmm. With she, an eye. Yeah, but she's with an eye, and she's Weinstein. There's no way we were going to do that when we got married. So. <laughs> yeah, so it, yeah, we've been here since, good Lord, 2009. My name's Lowell Waddell. I actually um, live in the Pacific Ridge area, and um, I've lived here for 35 years. <clears throat> I grew up in Puyallup, Washington, and um, I um, my, used to rodeo when I was younger. I was a team roper and grew up on quarter horses and, you know, that sort of thing. It was a great life growing up. One time, my dad decided he was going to raise pigs, and we had a thousand head of pigs on our hill. So that was very interesting. but. Um, I love Des Moines. I think I think the world of Des Moines, and I want to get back to the community and the kids. <clears throat> I'm really interested in the water park that they're thinking about building down in Des Moines at the marina to give back, and um, that's what I'm about. I I love the children and the community, and uh, I just want to get back to them. And uh, some I got a dog, a chocolate lab. He's six years old. His name's Willie, and I walk him around the block every day. And I get to know all the neighbors, everybody, because they love to pet my dog. And they all know him by name. And uh, when the ice cream truck comes, this is really fun, we, we set out with the kids, and he eats ice cream with me. I share ice cream, and the kids share ice cream with him, which is really cool. It's a happy dog. <laughs> and then right across the, the way is a park, the park right behind me. And they got a slide. 
So my dog goes over, climbs up the stairs, and slides down the, the slide with the kids. So it's really fun. So I just want to get back to the community. I love the community, and this is a beautiful city. Kind of reminds me of Murder, She Wrote, the little village she lived in, because everybody knows everyone, and everybody's really friendly and happy, and it's really nice to be here. So thank you. Hi, everybody. My name's David Emery. Um, I moved into the Redondo neighborhood uh, nearly nine years ago now. Um, and uh, I currently serve as the chair of the Redondo Community Association and uh, wanted to participate in the Citizens Advisory Committee to be a conduit uh, between the city and our roughly 160, 170 members in that community association down there. And uh, fun fact, I was uh, directly involved in the um, overseeing the clinical safety of hundreds of clinics involved in the initial COVID vaccine clinical trials. And my dad grew up in Bangor. <laughs> Okay, thanks. <laughs> I'm, I'm Bonnie Wilkins. Um, I have lived in the city my entire life. Um, I met my husband at school, Mount Rainier High School, go Rams. We've been married almost 40 years, and he is a harbor master at the marina, and we've raised our two kids here, and I am very fortunate to work with uh, wonderful, wonderful people, and uh, Des Moines is my home. It will be forever, and fun fact, I live in the house I grew up in. My fun fact is I grew up, I'm living in the house I grew up in. Yeah. That's it. Thank you. My fun fact is I was almost your neighbor because I lived in the, what would be the Zenith neighborhood off 242nd in the 60s before my folks moved us to Puyallup. So. I'm in the south. Uh, in yeah, the that's right. I was in the Zenith at the time when it was unincorporated King County. Um, really quick, I just want to tell you, uh, I did receive a tour of Des Moines, uh, the mayor and uh, city manager, and and Scott, the harbor master, uh, provided me a tour, and you guys have a beautiful community here. A lot of little fun, I totally agree with you, a lot of little fun um, aspects of the community that you don't really see a lot of places anymore. So um, I think that uh, it's wonderful, I'm glad to uh, be a part of this, but I also just wanted to take time to thank you because I know that this is a donation of your time to give back to the community, and I think that that should be recognized that you're volunteering your time to, to help your community um, be better, so thank you. All right, so um, we're gonna be passing around some citizens' uh, advisory handbooks here, and then I'm gonna pass it off to, back to the mayor, who's gonna give you a state of the city. All right, while well, you're, this is something for you to read later. It was just something that was written up on the original group, been modified and updated a little bit, but it just gives you a kind of a handbook of um, responsibilities and what the ordinance is and so forth. Um, so I'm gonna give you a, uh, I'm gonna give you the 15 minute version of the state of the city. So some of you may have questions afterwards. We'll keep it to a minimum. I wanna be sure to give the chief some time and then get into the homework and stuff like that. So I apologize if it's a little fast and brev there, there's a bit of brevity to it, but it's, it's uh, to make sure we can accomplish everything tonight that we set out to do. All right, so the city, and, and typically this is, this is a, a version of what I would typically, I try to go around to as many of the communities and and so forth and neighborhoods and so forth and give these types of presentations, Wesley, Judson, et cetera. So our city was established in 1959 and um, I'll be honest with you, it struggled since its inception, near bankruptcy at times, uh, struggled to get things done and the big one they got accomplished was in 1970 when they built the marina. But believe it or not though, it was, uh, it was actually something that wasn't supposed to happen but the uh, the citizens who were pushing through won, it, won a court battle, and now nobody would um, say that it wasn't a bad idea to have the marina, but it almost didn't happen. Um, <clears throat> what we've done in the last eight years under uh, city manager Michael Mathias is um, we've avoided bankruptcy by restructuring the city operations. There was, uh, 
there were several uh, furloughs issued and so forth to get us in, because we were living paycheck to paycheck, folks. And he implemented strong fiscal practices where now we have a, and we built a reserve for our general fund. Our finances were from a, when we had one of the worst credit ratings and bond ratings to now one of the best. And I think we're pretty close to actually achieving the best pretty soon. But the fact is, is we also have a 70% reserve and all of these kind of things. And we don't have the big ticket car dealerships or box stores or other things. So one of the restructures there was they diversified the revenues too. That's one of the reasons why we pay utility taxes and franchise fees and stuff like that, is that gave us a third leg of a stool to finance. So it's property taxes, which we've been able to help hold in pretty good check. Now, they're going up because of value and levies and other things, but your city's been very responsible. Sales and use tax, and of course, the, uh, the utility taxes are pretty much the three legs of our stool that fund our city. And one of the most promising things, and it's been over like the last five years, not the eight, is Michael and the staff have found ways to get other people's money, over $30 million. And a lot of this isn't matching grants and other things that, that can be sticky and cause problems down the road. Um, anyway, it's been a, it, there, there's been some really good work over the last eight years that a lot of people don't realize. So I always like to call that out. Let's go to the next slide. All right. <clears throat> So the marina is obviously a big issue, and we're, we're working, uh, we continue to work on it. In fact, we have a big meeting on Thursday to discuss the bond issue. Um, part of what the structure and the councils before me did is they got everything physically sound, have done all of the, this work and groundwork to be able to finally develop the marina. We've been talking about developing the marina since 1984 at a minimum. Right, and the, we've had multiple conversations on the same issues and so forth, but it's never been built. And part of it's because of funding and money, and part of it's been, uh, quite honestly, I think a bit of fear of change. But it, we want something that we can all enjoy. So one of the things, as you guys have already seen, is the bulkhead was recently completed. The walls were raised to accommodate the new water levels, the rising water tables and so forth. And as you can see, that's a sample of, it's very nice and beautiful and, and it's a, gonna be a great place to um, enjoy. The, um, the, we, uh, like I said, we'll be discussing the bonding. Uh, adaptive purpose building is going to be delayed in this process. We feel that we can wait on that for a few more years, but it's still in our plans to do. We wanna do dry stack storage for the smaller boats and open up some of the slips in the marina for larger boats. We can increase the revenue by at least a million and a half or more dollars annually. And what we're doing is we're trying to create a marina that's gonna last the next 50 or 100 years, not just survive today, right? Um, there is gonna be no hotel in the parking lot. Now, this was very controversial with a lot of people, and understandably so. The one thing I'm going to say is that as council members, we have to entertain what is the highest use of every piece of city property. And that was the basis of why we were con considering it. It would have captured a price that would have been far more than something against, say, the cliffside, and it would have gone, had we, say, we sold that property or another one, it would have contribute, all that money would have gone to the marina steps and the development and so forth and would have reduced the amount we have to bond. So this is one of the things we were doing, but we looked at it from structural integrity and the possibility, but it was something that a lot of investors and developers asked us to consider, so we did. But the truth is we came up and said, no, it's not gonna go in the north parking lot. It also happens to be an RCO granted property where it has to be parking and if you do something there you have to find uh, additional parking somewhere else anyway the, i just want you to know that through the process as we go through particularly the marina steps there will all there will be a public process that will be included so we don't have the details now but i want to assure you when you talk to people there will be a public process that will be part of the process anyway uh obviously the key to the vision you can see this, the, the, the one slide, and I'll probably have to change that one on the right, where we had the hotel kind of laid there as a potential layout. The whole idea here is to tie the marina and economic development to the city. We want marina steps coming in, so it, it's a great place for our residents to spend, but also bring in people for economic drivers. Um, 
the quarter deck is one of those that benefits from that. It's a beautiful place we all like to be. Everybody likes to take their family there. We've done the ferry service, which not only gives a great ability for you guys to go um, to Seattle, but it's brought in people. We've had several restaurants that in the first couple weeks of a month were making their month from previous years because of the ferry service. So it drives economic advantage. We're looking at the future, what it could mean. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the ferry later. But, but, the, but you can see the adaptive purpose building and 223rd, we have a vision to have that be both a road and then a very beautiful landscape walkability to, to tie us to the downtown. We've also, if you've noticed the behind the theater and stuff, we, we buried all the power lines and everything like that. Cause eventually we think uh, like a kind of an alley, you know, like a, what's the word I'm looking for? It's a post alley. Post alley. That's the word post alley kind of feels so we can have businesses there. We see the downtown with these kind of economic drivers, jobs up in the business park, the light rail station, the college and so forth that our city is going to become a really cool place to be. It's going to have new buildings. The theater is a perfect example. One or the one on 227th. And there's talk of we have a lot of investors and developers very interested in our in our town for the future. The key is how do we keep the small town feel, but move forward as we need to do so we don't look like 1962 and have a lot of vacant lots or derelict properties, right? So it's it's a balance and some of the things you're going to be giving input on are going to help us guide us that way. Um, okay, let's go to the next slide. So obviously the ferry service. The ferry was supposed to be here by Mother's Day. Unfortunately, it ran into some Coast Guard issues in San Francisco. And if it's not on the way, I think it's a day away. But the hope is to try to get it in as early in June as we can. And we have a contract. We'll figure out what we do, how much we pay. But we just want we want that service to get here as fast as possible because I'm telling you, it was in the high 90s of satisfaction rate of how many people enjoyed it. And it gave them, they were bringing their family down enjoying the marina, taking the boat right over there, enjoying Seattle, and we've expanded the days and the times to try to get some of the commuting piece in it. We're having, conver there's gonna be a slight increase to the rates. They were pretty good and a little bit subsidized, but the, and this program is, is subsidized, I'll be honest with you, but it's an investment in your community. The PR values, the increase to the businesses in our community, and the fact that I might, you might look at it almost like a park where you can enjoy great space and time, but it's not something that makes you money. But it gives your residents a great option to do great things. But in addition, one of the biggest benefits was it brought a lot of tourists that after they've seen the market and the waterfront, they don't want to spend much time in Seattle. So coming here, and we could see in the future Tacoma, Point Ruston, Gig Harbor, being part of it, if it's not year round, at least over the summer months. And this would be, this is one of those where all those people are gonna eat in our restaurants, shop in our shops, visit our town, um, and it, it provides a great opportunity. So I'm excited about what it can offer. Um, <clears throat> so, it, like I said, we went through a long road, we raised our bond rating, we did all these things, but we have, and I'm not gonna, tie into it too much because the chief gets to say it, but we have a really effective law enforcement. We have our own shield. If you guys have been paying attention to Burien and the homeless encampment and everything else, mm -hmm. one of their big problems is they don't have their own shield. So they have the King County issue and stuff like that. We have been, we've made it uh, a public safety, one of the priorities in this town and we've done really well. Considering a town our size and to have the quality police force we do, we all, really should be thankful and after the meeting you can shake the chief's hand because he's been a big part of it the theater i bother those guys every day about when they're going to be done um uh, lloyd and i do yoga with them and we we actually rough them up a little bit about it but occupancy they're trying to get the occupancy for the apartments probably later this year with the hopes open the theater sometime early next year is the goal they've heard so far uh, they would all say that building a building within a, within a building was probably not the route. They would have, if they could do it over again, they would have just built new construction with the look and feel of how it is. But what I think it is, is the domino that pushes the rest of Des Moines forward because it gives you the imagery and everything of the way our city could look. This particular property had a height bonus. Um, we're very selective in the south end of the town about height bonuses because we want to protect the views of the people up on the hill. 
Um, also, uh, I'll take these two, to, two together. We've been adding parks and we want to make sure we recognize the presence of the indigenous people. We had the Van Gaskin property. It was a house that was not a historical site. It had been re it actually been moved 100 feet back when they hydroed out down to below. And it would have been about $2 million to develop and preserve that site that nobody could use. We found, um, we found the presence of indigenous people here and we want to make sure we recognize that. So we did. So we worked in partnership with them when we made it the, the view park to incorporate the presence of the tribe. So they offered, there's a, there's a totem story pole there, and there's, of course, the story rocks that some of the tribe members had put there that are relative to some of the uh, structure that's on our beach and stuff. But they definitely used it to fish Des Moines Creek, as well as um, probably clam, and they lived up in that area where, where, the, where that park is. And you can see the park, and, and anybody who hasn't been there needs to stop by. It's a spectacular view. It gives you kind of the look and feel of what we're looking for as we move to the rest of the marina and tie it together. Um, you see this is a yoga session, but it's been a fantastic thing. Okay, next slide, please. Landmark on the Sound. This is all I'm gonna say about it. It's under EIS and it's taking some time. Um, it's, it's one of those properties where it's private property. It's not protected by historic, but it, it, it is being re reviewed for its cultural and historical value. And that's the extent of what I can speak to it, but I don't have any answers. And if I did, I couldn't talk about them. Uh, multimodal transportation with the ferry and we have our 635 bus service, which by the way, we partnered with Metro before on the bus service and now they're funding it fully because we proved it. We see the potential that the rest of the, the city of Des Moines as the other ones open up of having these east west last mile types of community of, of transportation o along of course with the light rail I take it every day when I go to go to my job at Nordstrom it's it's fantastic and what we want to do is be able to uh, get out of as many cars it's the same I plan on commuting on the boat of, and doing the walk up to my office as well um, this year and I encourage if any of you guys get the opportunity to do the same Obviously, the Marina Bulkhead we already talked about. It's wonderful uh, view. I think that's the picture my wife took, right? Um, and uh, I use on my screensaver. And of course, we're planning on doing Redondo improvements. I didn't include all the slides I gave for your guys' presentation, but we're gonna be spending millions of dollars down there. We're, re we're redoing the fishing pier. We're, we're moving the bathrooms. They should have never been against the water. A lot of times the logs break the plumbing underneath. That's gonna go to the parking lot right? It was something done by King County back in the day. So, uh, and, and who wants to, in their pictures, have a view of a restroom <laughs> taking weight? So we're going to open that up and give better access to the beach and then move it a really nice facility with retail capabilities and a shower for divers. Um, and then we're going to incorporate the two parking lots in the marina as well as the Redondo, where our residents can buy the season pass, $30, $25 on the renewal, and they can use either one intermittently. So it'll be a great value for that. And then we charge uh, non-residents a little bit more than that, but it gives you access to it with the cards or, or there'll be the low cost um, on an hourly or, or visitation rate. Okay, next slide. Uh, anyway, this is a little bit about a Redondo. It had a great history. Uh, there was a marina there that, that was torn down, unfortunately. So once you tear something out of the water, it's tough to get it back and almost impossible. There was the Amusodrome, which has a great history. Um, um, and I'll encourage you to pursue some of the history down at Redondo. It had a lot of ours. We were between Tacoma and Seattle. So there was a lot of, a lot of uh, we'll say lawless fun as well in the city of, of Des Moines. Um, but it's, it's a wonderful place. Um, it's our other gem on the south border. Of course, we've got we're one of the few cities, we're long and narrow. We've got Redondo, a great place, and if a lot of you have been down there, you need to go back again. Of course, we've got Saltwater State Park and then the marina itself. So it's fantastic. We've got assets no one else has, and we wanna make sure we maximize those where we can. The state park's handled by the state, right? But we can take care of two great spots that all our community likes to congregate to, and that is Redondo and the marina. So that's one of our focuses. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a real quick thing about the fishing pier. So I want to just 
take the reason why I left this one in is this fishing pier is going to be rebuilt the same kind of footprint it is but this is the new regulations as part of the marina nowadays you can't build wood decking anymore on a on it and it requires an act of God of, of per ecological permits and so forth. St federal level, state level, county level, everything. Because everybody wants to make sure you do it responsibly in the water. The, 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 the piers have to be of a non-leaching concrete and all these other great things. But the deck has to be the ability to have light through. So one of the conversations we have is the marina. Eventually we're going to have to get rid of the covered moorage. Not only is it two and a half times the cost to do covered moorage, but honestly, we're not very confident that we'd even get the permitting to do so. The effort is to have the light pass through because the sea life flourishes more in the sunlight. So I just wanted to show you that, but that kind of gives you an example. But I also wanted to talk about it because it shows you the complexity of trying to do something that appears to be simple. Of course, we had COVID and other things, but uh, the, our friends at the state level, our state legislators, please say thank you to them, have been very generous in getting us some of the funding for this project. Next slide. There's a little example of the restroom. Obviously, you can tell it looks a little bit, has a look and feel of the one that uh, we have down in the north parking lot, and we're also gonna do one on the for the tenants that's kind of midway between uh, Anthony's and uh, the Harbor Master's office. Go ahead. Um, I kind of leave this, really quick questions because I want to turn it over to the chief but if you have questions I'll go ahead and ask them but otherwise I mean we'll get to talk about a lot of this stuff at the next meeting as well so with that I'm not seeing any I'm gonna turn it back over to you yeah. oh sure what about the old salties what's being done with that oh so good good question um, we know that he plans on opening up in June they've been working on it it did take some damage from the king's tides, which are higher than they've ever been, uh, but that is the intent, is to open that uh, sometime in June. I know they've been working on it and they have their permits and everything. Yeah, so it's good news. And we have food trucks down there on certain days too to give our the residents down on the south end some options. Okay, so this first meeting, of course, we just wanted to kind of do a meet and greet, get to know each other, right? Uh, also hear from the mayor um, about a little overview of the city. But we also know the next meeting coming up is the, um, the meet and greet for the police chief candidates. And so we did think that, you know, a great opportunity would be for you to hear tonight from current police chief Ken Thomas to kind of give an overview of policing in Des Moines. So. All right, well, thank over. you very much. About, <laughs> I'm retiring in about 30 days, for those that didn't hear that. Yeah, yeah that was my fun he's fact. He's forgetful, so we have to do these kind of things, so he's probably close. <laughs> so I just want to hit a couple of the highlights, and really, uh, this is your guys' committee, so... If you have any questions, please, at any time, fire them away at me because this is for you guys, it's not for me. So uh, I'm gonna hit some highlights and then answer any questions or concerns that, that you guys have and, and just fire away. So first of all, uh, mental health and, and dealing with mental health issues, you wouldn't maybe think that that's a police department thing, but it's very important to us uh, for quality of life and making things as good as they possibly can be for our community. And that's being able to effectively engage with uh, people with mental health problems, drug addiction problems, and, and the other areas that get left to police officers to deal with. And quite honestly, police officers aren't the best uh, people to always deal with those uh, people having those types of difficulties. So. A, a few years ago, I think it's been maybe uh, close to that, the city council, the city administration authorized us funding to get uh, two positions for uh, social workers to work with members of the community that need help. It's been about two years and we still only have one position filled. Believe it or not, we've had over 78 applications or people that have gone through the process and only one has made it 
there's been issues with background investigations or people uh, pulling out at the last minute and deciding that it's not for them. So it's a tough, it's been very tough. It's been one of the most difficult things. Uh, this has been a real priority for us. Now we have four more interviews coming up in June to try to fill that second position, but it's tough and we, we can't lower our standards. I don't think our standards are unrealistic, but you can't have a criminal background too, too criminal. There's some minor stuff we were willing to, to overlook, uh, but you have to have access to police uh, records and the police facility, and there are some federal standards that we have to follow, and that's really uh, what's catching us up on, on some of that. But I did get some statistics for the first quarter of this year that I thought you might find interesting, and this is just in our city. Uh, our one uh, officer, Monica, she has uh, made 310 uh, contacts with homeless people, uh, 36 mental health contacts, and she's assisted on 95 different patrol calls where there will be an unwanted person at a location or another low-level crime or incident that the police get dispatched to, and Monica will respond and uh, manage that uh, situation to help the officers out. And also it helps out the person uh, who's involved. So really uh, just looking at those numbers, I think it's a really positive thing. And, and she has some good success stories where she's gotten people into programs and housing and help. And, and if you listen to the experts, and I'm by no means an expert, but I do listen to them and, and pay attention, many of them say you have to have contact with a person at least, I think it's like 18 times or 24 times, where you're told no before sometimes you finally can get them to accept uh, help. So, uh, hey, I don't know, I'll listen to the experts. We're gonna keep trying until we can get it to work because we wanna be respectful to everybody, but that includes respectful to the good, honest, hardworking, tax-paying residents that, and business owners that don't want to have homeless people camping out in their front yard or in their business and doing what they do and you, you see the garbage and the mess, we're not gonna put up with that either, but we're gonna be respectful and, and get them into some help and, and treatment or whatever they need uh, but not at the expense of our community. So a little bit of a challenge, but we work it hard every day. Uh, another thing that is uh, interesting to note for policing, and, and this will be good for your candidate forum, if you guys uh, are part of interviewing the, or, or the presentation for the new police chief candidates that you'll see next week. The pendulum swung pretty hard towards pr uh, police reforms through the legislature and the change in the laws and, and some of the other uh, things through the legislature. Well, that's starting to swing back a little bit. We're getting there, but there's a couple challenges. Uh, first of all, the pursuit law. Now, the pursuit law got a little bit better. It went from needing probable cause to per pursue somebody for a very violent Crime. I say very violent because there's a whole list of violent crimes that don't count that you can't pursue for uh, to include property crimes. So if we have businesses and people, uh, I know I had to uh, discipline a couple of our officers because somebody took a stolen U-Haul truck, backed it in through the front of a business, took out the door and the windows, hooked up a... a a cable around the ATM and tore it out of the business and and then took off and uh, the officers found it a ways away and they got in a pursuit. Well, you can't pursue a vehicle uh, that's property crime only. And as much as that pains me, because I grew up, drive fast, stay up late and catch bad guys, and now I'm getting people in trouble for that. Uh, which is a little bit crazy, but hey, the rules are the rules and we're gonna follow the rules. 
and we have to have accountability and make sure that our officers do the right thing. They didn't get disciplined too bad, but they, they got formally disciplined just to make sure, hey, this is the rule and you have to follow what's going on. So uh, this change in the pursuit law wouldn't have changed that. You still can't chase people for property crimes. So um, we have cars still every day, probably five to six times a week, maybe more. The officer will try to pull them over for speeding or some other violation. They just take off and keep going. We can't pursue them for that. So it is absolutely crazy out there for the police officers that try to do their jobs and they can't. So if they have the license plate number, can they go try to find them? They can later on, but if they can't identify who was driving the car, it doesn't get them, it doesn't uh, help us too much. So. Boy, we've been working on that really hard, but yes, I agree with you. Any help we can get, uh, that would be good. State legislators. Yeah, it's, yeah. Or the Karen Kaisers. And yeah, yep. Insurance adjustments, too. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the next thing is the legislature, thank goodness, this year at the last minute with a special session, uh, passed the Blake Law, and they did fine, they did, uh, Good. Uh, the initial uh, proposal from the Senate was very good, and this is pretty close, close enough. Uh, but so what it says is if you're in possession of uh, drugs, hard drugs, fentanyl, methamphetamine, whatever, um, for a while there, it wasn't going to be a crime at all. Now it's a gross misdemeanor, so there is a crime. But the complete focus is to try to push people to get into treatment. And if we can get them into treatment, they'll dismiss the crime completely. <clears throat> but uh, I was just reading an article today, so it was perfect timing for tonight's meeting. And I've seen this before, but it just reminded me in Oregon, you might know that Oregon kind of legalized drugs also, but they said, hey, we'll write you a ticket, and as long as you call in, all you have to do is make a phone call to call into this place to see if maybe you need help or not. They got like less than 10% compliance with just people to call in, and then the ticket would go away. They didn't even comply with that because the accountability level, if you don't comply with it, nothing happens to you anyway. So it was a great experiment that if you have no accountability, people aren't going to do anything and I think the I, I was writing my notes and then I read the article but I was saying hey we need to make sure we have money for treatment because that's always the biggest downfall is we have not enough places for people to go to treatment get effective treatment and I'm reading this article in Oregon and they have a surplus of funds for treatment because there's no accountability attached and if there's no accountability attached they won't go to treatment so if there's not a it's a crime if you don't get this treatment or you're going to go to a jail for a certain amount of days unless you get this treatment. Without that push, people aren't going to do it. So I, and I'm just, this is just a little side thing because I was a narcotics detective for a year. So I, I'm a little sensitive on this one. I, I sit, I, uh, I'm done now because I'm retiring, but I sat on the governor's task force on sentencing reform or some goofy thing. But anyway, I, I, I'm part of this thing and people are saying, what we've done in the past doesn't work. We need to do just treatment or it has to be non-punitive or, and I'm saying, show me where that has worked ever by doing nothing. See, we, we always say what used to happen doesn't work, but now we'll do this other thing and, and I, call BS on that a little bit and I say show me we're doing nothing and let people continuously break into businesses break into cars steal cars our auto theft is completely off that's what happens when you do nothing is my argument so anyway I can be a little speak a little more freely now that I'm retiring you can know what I really feel but that's what that's the reality of what's going on. Okay, so well, they fixed it, and, and I think we should support, you talk about supporting our representatives, any chance you can get, support our representatives in getting treatment facilities and treatment for people that need help. I believe that's the only way we're gonna get out of this issue and problem is 
People get addicted, people have challenges, problems, but we need to help them and help them get out of it. Not just jail and not just nothing. I think there's a good happy medium. So that's a, a real big deal that, that we really should support. Tina Orwall, our representative, is probably one of the top people in the legislature that works on those types of issues and, and she's wonderful at that. So any chance you get to support her. Uh, yeah. Good. Well, thank you for saying something nice about Tina. I thought you were going to say, Chief, you're full of baloney. You don't know what you're talking about. I, I, she's been a supporter. Yeah. I'm, I'm a little bit smart, and that's not, like I said, it's just not a broken alcohol. So right. So it's lost in love of Truman Center, but, um, you know, to your point, uh, that I, I kind of agree with that. Yeah. Uh, and, and like you say, we love to support the program. It's going to take us a long time to yeah. listen to some information. This can be done. Today. Yep. Uh, the other um, issue with the legislature, they had an opportunity to help support the cities and counties with recruiting and hiring more police officers. And it would not have been at a higher tax rate to you. It, the, the ask was right now, what percent of the taxes go to the, the state sales tax? So say 10% goes to the state, it would have been 0.1% if they would have let the cities and county, uh, for each one of the counties, keep that 0.1%. So it didn't increase your taxes, but it just was a one-tenth of 1% 1 less that goes to the state to support criminal justice funding, to bring in more police officers, and to bring in uh, any policing issues for the community and it didn't pass, and it wouldn't be a big, as big of a deal if people didn't know that Washington State ranks 51st in the United States. And somebody should say, that's BS, Chief, because there's only 50 states. But there's also the District of Columbia. So not only are we lower than any other state in the United States, but also the District of Columbia in officers per thousand. So we already have the lowest rate of officers and we we're just trying to get up into not being in last place anymore. And we didn't get that, unfortunately. Uh, that help that uh, we would hope to get from the state. So that's an unfortunate uh, uh, issue that didn't pass. My top priority issue, by the way, I was pushing for that one the hardest, uh, but I lost on that one. So. But all of these issues with the legislature impact our quality of life in our community. And, and I just want you to be aware of that. And the new chief that comes in as you talk with them and, and work through to see uh, who you think is the best candidate, those are some good questions. Hey, here's some challenges in policing and, and what are your ideas and what do you wanna do to fix it uh, or do your part to help support it. So I think those are some pretty good um, issues. Now back to the city, really there's two different uh, cities when you really look at Des Moines. There's Pacific Highway South, which is pretty tough. Uh, before, many of you know, before I came to Des Moines, I was in the city of Kent. So I've been associated with Pacific Highway South that shares the border, Kent and Des Moines, for the past 35 years. So I failed because I don't know that we've significantly made it that much better. That's a tough neighborhood. But I can tell you the other parts of Des Moines, the North Hill, uh, even Pacific Ridge, uh, Redondo, uh, Woodmont, the whole, the central area, the rest of the city, uh, really, if you look at it, um, we're kind of an oasis in King County. We are an absolute gem of a community. And uh, we want to keep it that way. We want to do everything that we possibly can to, number one, work with Kent to do what we can on Pacific Highway South, but keep the rest of the community as good as it is. So that's uh, a big goal that, that you guys should be thinking about for next week and, and in the future. That's what we've been working on in the past. And uh, I think our department's uh, done a pretty good job. 
A couple things, technology really quick. We've got two different camera systems going on right now as we speak. Flock cameras, and you may have heard us talk about this a little bit at council. This is a system where it just catches the back of the car or a picture of the car and the license plate. And so we're in coordination with Tukwila and Kent. I think SeaTac is uh, in the process of getting them. We have 10 of those cameras installed right now. The other eight uh, we have set with, to be within the next week or two to be installed in the city of Des Moines. And really it's to impact violent crime. So Kent has 20 or 30 of them with our 18 and with Tukwila's, we kind of have the areas. This is the fastest growing crime, uh, I want to say prevention type of issue in the state of Washington right now. And uh, Yakima, I mean, Yakima is a tough city. It's got a lot of crime and violent crime. I was talking to their chief a couple months ago. He said their flock camera systems reduced violent crime by 56% in their city and uh, property crime by even more than that because what they're doing is they're catching the people. They're getting, so they don't have to pursue them and chase them down. They're seeing, okay, at this date and time, this crime was committed, this is what the car looks like. And even if it's a stolen car, they're on the lookout for that car. And if they don't get it that day, they'll get it within a day or two and they're putting together huge cases on violent crime, property crime, solved many homicide cases. Uh, it's unbelievable technology. So, so these are different from your, you know, catching going through the red light? Yes, camera? completely different. Because the state law says you cannot use the cameras for getting you going through a red light for anything other than getting you go through a red light. So there's actually unsolved homicides in the state of Washington where the homicide vehicle drove through the red light and they won't give you a search warrant to review the video because it's written strictly into the law that it can only be used for that purpose. I don't wanna go sideways, but what happened is in California, a legislator or city council person was driving through one of those and somebody was in his passenger seat that probably shouldn't have been and that uh, came up and got him. So now everybody's scared to death that, no, privacy is too important. Not that you needed to know that, but it is a true story that's very interesting. So we have 18 cameras situated around the city now and there's more coming. No, we have 10 that have been installed. We're gonna have 18 total. So we have eight more coming. So that's one system, the flock camera system for violent crime. And then the other system, we do have speed cameras in school zones. We do have red light cameras. But now, uh, tomorrow, or Thursday at the city council meeting, our city council is uh, gonna vote on the new contract for red light, or I'm sorry, speed zone cameras in Redondo. So the boardwalk has been designated as a park and the law just designated you can put speed zone cameras in parks. So we're gonna get two, uh, actually four cameras, one going each direction in two different locations down at Redondo. So we're using technology, we're trying to be smart to deal with crime. There's another issue down at Redondo on two, between 280th and 281st and Redondo Beach Drive with people will go down there and party and park their car right in the middle of the road uh, it's kind of an off street, but, and so uh, the fire marshal and the fire chief designated those as a fire zone. So it's now been painted and marked up. And I think the council just last month uh, upped the fine from $25 to 200, 200, $250 for parking or standing in a, in a fire zone. So we're trying to use, we're trying to be smart in addressing and, and dealing with uh, problems. Uh, and then finally, we are in very serious discussions and looking to expand our business grant uh, program for helping those businesses that have had their windows smashed out due to vandalism, where the city is gonna, uh, we're looking to help expand that outside of the downtown core area to, to do the rest of the city. So we're trying to uh, track down some more money and then go to the council and, and get their approval, but uh, that's something that we're actively 
working on. And then finally, just uh, for the sake of the police department, currently we have two officer positions that are unfilled. One of them is a person that's already accepted a job, but he works at a different police department now. And they're, he, so he's a lateral officer. And they're in contract negotiations just about to be finalized and they get uh, retro pay for the time they've been working without a new contract. So as soon as that gets resolved, he's gonna come to work for us, but we are honoring the fact that it's probably 30 to $40,000 that he would get in retro pay. So we're gonna, and if he leaves, he doesn't get that money. So it would be silly for him to walk away from that kind of money. So we're gonna let him wait till that gets resolved and then he'll be in. So then we're only one, position down and I have four uh, interviews for new hire officers next Monday. So we're right up there and we've been in very good shape uh, really for the last couple of years with very few open positions. So uh, things are going extremely well uh, in our police department. So uh, I wish you luck next week. I think we have three very good candidates that could do the job and, and we really appreciate your time again, two weeks in a row, but and your input that you provide us on who would be the best person to take over and, and lead our department. So thank you for your time and Victoria. How, how best can we accomplish that? What's the format going to be? And I mean, are we just going to like descend upon these three people and willy nilly I mean, what jeopardy, how, jeopardy. how are we going to be able Here's, here's my under, yeah, here's my understanding. Uh, I talked with Michael today and I think there's going to be a period where just you guys have time to interact with them, but they'll give each give like a little presentation. This is who I am, you know, one at a time. And then you'll get a chance to ask them any questions if you have any, and they'll be able to kind of interact with you. I think that's the format. And then I yeah. think there's going to be an opportunity for you to provide feedback, some sort of a form format where you can say, hey, I like number one or number two or number three, and this is why. Because uh, the city manager, quite frankly, wants to know what your feelings are and kind of why and, and your impressions on the candidates and uh, he's going to take that into consideration. And fortunately, on the second day, the, the day after that uh, event, which is why I'm not going to go, on Wednesday morning, I'm part of an interview panel. And I want to have a, an, a real fair, objective opportunity uh, to sit on that interview panel. And um, Michael, uh, fortunately, I think fortunately for me, and I think fortunately for our department, because I love our our police department. I, the, we've just got a great, great group of police officers and, and staff, and um, I want to do everything possible to make sure it gets better than I leave it. I think I heard that somewhere. Uh, I want to do the same thing. So uh, Michael is going to allow me to be part of the process and the final decision making on um, I don't get to be the final decision maker. He does. He's the boss. But he'll listen to my input on who I think would be, uh, at least I get to be a part of the process. So I'm, I'm very appreciative of that. Really quick, I just checked with uh, Bonnie. So you guys will get chances, opportunities to talk to the candidates. There'll be cards there that we'd prefer that you be able to fill out your preferred choices there and put them in a box. If for some reason you can't, you can email um, with your ch choice that way. But the idea will be Bonnie. It wouldn't be us. Um, just so it gets through. But the idea is it, with the preferred method, be use the box there that day and that night. No, yeah, there will be, but we there will be public. But we wanted to make sure that you were all invited, right? That was one of the primary focuses of this group was to get you guys there because these are the kind of things that you can help us make that selection process yes yeah so everybody can because it's that but 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 here's the thing if yeah I can, go ahead when i met with michael this morning 
I think we're going to try to make a decision. He wants to try to make a decision on Thursday after the thing is over. So don't wait. If you're going to email it in, don't think about it for a while and then email it in. Email it in Wednesday night when you're done if you don't fill out the card because I think on Thursday he's going to talk about making a decision. And uh, if you want to have your input taken, yes? Well, I mean, you want to know. You want someone who can make a decision. Uh, you want someone that's going to care about the community, and I think that can look a community member in the eye, look at Redondo in the eye. Let's use Redondo Rick because he's not here, but he's probably watching on TV. Hi, Rick. Rick is tough. <laughs> And you got to be able to look at Rick and when he says you're not doing enough and, and do more and you got to say, you know what, we're going to do our best and we're going to we're going to give it everything we've got and and mean it from your heart. Uh, when you're up on Pack Highway or you're a business that's had your window smashed, someone that will go out there and say, you know what, it's tough. Yeah, the state changed the law, all these things. You'll never hear me one time use that as an excuse why things aren't working right. Hey, everything changes. It changes for all of us. The last thing a, a resident or a business owner or a, someone that's had their car stolen or broken into wants to hear is the police complaining about they changed the law. Really, the answer should be figure it out. They changed the law. Yeah, that's too bad. Figure out how you can make it work with the law changed. Be adaptable. I guess that's another bullet point. So be able to work with the rules and the guidelines and follow the rules and, and do what it takes. But you got to care about the community. you got to care about the people. Uh, you have to be able to make decisions uh, that are in the best interest of the people. I always say to the, I'm really close with the union president and vice president, but I am not afraid to tell them, the police department doesn't exist, so you and your guys get great benefits and you're all happy. The police department exists to keep this darn community safe. And that's the number one priority. Not And the union guys, it's their number one priority to take care of wages, working conditions, blah, blah, blah. And that's true, that's good, that's important. What's more important is keeping our community safe and taking care of the community. That's what we want in a police chief. I think I've hit four, Chuck. I'm going to try to get the fifth one. I'll think of it on the run. We have one, we have one, and it's just down in Redondo. Uh, not in Redondo, down in Redondo, but at 272nd and Pack Highway. Yeah, and really the, the uh, I, I just told you not making excuses, and it's not an excuse, uh, but COVID knocked us out on that one, and we are having a hard time recovering. At one time, we had 14 people working out of there, and now I'm struggling with three or four different agencies and uh, now we're having a hard time getting that up and going. A lot of our agencies are so far down in staffing, not our agency, but others that we had partnered with, that it's just we're still fighting and scratching and clawing to try to keep that going. But I found that I remembered my fifth one. Thank you. I'll, go, I'll come back to you. But my fifth bullet point, just so I don't let you down, someone that can work with other not only inner departments within the city, but within the region. You need to find a person that can coordinate and work together with others. That's the only way to be successful, to really be successful. We have Pack Highway, lots of possibilities for bad, violent crime. We don't have enough guys to take, guys and gals to take care of that ourselves sometimes. So we built those partnerships, being on the ATF, Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Task Force, FBI Task Force. And what happens is now when we have something like that go, instead of our five detectives, we've got 15 detectives because we call in all of our partnerships and friends and we work that thing like crazy. 
So that is smart policing, is working together, pooling together our resources. So those are some of the things, and I hit five of them. Don't ask me to repeat them if you didn't pick them up. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, see, Kent has their own uh, substation that I put in when I was a chief there at 260th and Pack Highway. So they are still using that one. We're using the one at 272nd. But what happens is uh, we also had King County Sheriff's Office there. We had Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. We had many different agencies in there, and that's why it's not, it hasn't caught back up. We work very closely uh, with Kent a lot along Pacific Highway and King County Metro. Uh, so the partnership there is very strong. Yeah. And the last question that you want to ask is the three candidates, is anybody from the Moines? Um, no. No, okay, so all from outside? All three are from the outside. All from Washington State. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> They're all from cities. <laughs> Honestly, in uh, for the integrity of the process, I'm not being funny. Uh, I but I, I can't say uh, out of respect for the process. That's all you can get out of me. You got quite a bit out of me, but that's all. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? That's all I have uh, on my part. I probably went too long, but if I did, I'm sorry. I want to make sure you got the time. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Service, yeah, thank you. So we're going to go fishing after we're done. Yes, sir. <laughs> I don't dive, uh, but. But I'm going, uh, I already have, actually my last week at work, this is another fun fact. I, look at all these fun facts I'm coming up with. Uh, my last week at work, I'm on vacation because I uh, have a trip planned to go salmon fishing up in Alaska. So. Oh, yeah. All right, thank you. That was a great overview. Um, so now the homework part. Right, so you guys got some overview of the city, got some overview to hopefully prep you for next week, uh, got to know each other a little bit. We will not be testing you or quizzing you on everyone else's fun facts next uh, time we come together. So, uh, but we may have to have like a taco night or something. I don't know, but um, but we're ass I'm assuming next meeting we were talking about sometime in July. Is that still okay? We are going to try to find a date in July. I know it gets hard during the summer to try to get everybody here. Um, but we're going to try to find something that works for everybody. So we're going to ask you to come back with um, some items. So some, put some thought into it. Um, of course, tonight you don't need it, but for the next time we come back together. So we're looking for you to come back with the three most important things for your neighborhood. So what's most important for your neighborhood? Top three. And then what's the, what do you feel are the three most important things for the city? Right? So. Um, I'm assuming we're gonna have some crossover, uh, but you know we're looking for it. Just we're, we're making that very broad. So, what are the three most important things, um, from your opinion, for the city and for your neighborhood specifically? Do you want to add to that? No. Nope. Nope, okay. Pretty much it. Go ahead. Have we, is it our opinion, or are we conferring with the other humans? <laughs> um, so, I think for I mean, if you're talking with your your neighborhood. Um, I think that it would be, you know, what is collectively, what are they thinking? Uh, if you've heard your neighbors talking or you've had those conversations to bring back that input to represent your neighborhood. Um, as far as the city goes, you could have the same conversations with your neighbors as to what they're feeling as far as the city as well. But I think that the city piece could also just be more of your feelings on that. Um, I think that we're wanting, you know, you're representing your neighborhood. So I think that for the neighborhood piece, um, talking with your neighbors a little bit more to get their input would yeah, be great. So the answer was yes to both. <laughs> <laughs> really, it's that's part of it, the conduit piece I was talking about is you're getting them. And so, you know, you're going to obviously represent your own values. It's like us as council members. We have this, but we're checking with all people all the time. So it's the same kind of concept. So the more people you talk to, the better. Um, I'd love to have email addresses of all of us. 
I, you know, I want to find out if I did know your dad. You know. <laughs> We're all in that group. Yeah. We already have everybody from the group. But, I, but Bonnie, Bonnie said we'll, she'll put a roster together and oh, get that sent out. Because yeah. if I could find it, that would be awesome, but I yeah. don't know. Yeah. <laughs> That. Yeah, yeah. So this is the thing is, is you guys were selected to be the representatives. If we were doing a survey or a poll, it kind of gets into the mix of that. I'd, I would steer away from that. It's more about, I know a lot of you, and one of the things through review of your application and so forth, I know a lot of you that talk to a lot of your neighbors. And you're, like anybody, you're going to get a section of, you know, but broadening in that expanse like introduce yourself to new people and things is good but i think it's more about you than it is to try because then it turns into a survey and then what's the purpose of the group you guys are representing your neighborhoods and that's what we want to try to keep it as you know um there'll be public surveys on marinas and things like that uh, as a future but in this particular case i think it's more that down that down home spun talking to your neighbor kind of thing and we don't expect you to be able to talk to every single neighbor and you're not going to get, you know, marked down if you don't come back with me talking to everybody. You, be, yeah. you better have your list, list and everything checked, yeah. <laughs>
checked one night, and yeah. you know, Terry's up here, and I'm up out there, and I'm always like, <laughs> yeah. And it's one of the reasons why <clears throat> I don't like to use cell phones at the city council meeting, but it's oftentimes what it does is when either channel 21 or that's I, I, it lights up and we know there's a problem so we have somebody in IT try to fix it it's so communicating to Bonnie immediately if that should occur yeah. because this was one of the times I did actually didn't get anything and do you have do you have Comcast no, that's even okay I was, I was just gonna say that's an alternative sometimes Fortunately, YouTube does have it, so you can at least go back and watch it later yeah. if it happens. It's it's not a perfect world in that regard, but but we love when people let us know right away there's a problem because usually we can fix it. But when they don't till after, like first we'd heard of it. Yeah, I know. Can you give us an update on Condor and whether they are finished with the 101 for you folks? Because we're just waiting for oh, them to this is this is as much I'll, I'll give you an update is we're all scheduled for them I think some people have already a couple of viewed and then others are scheduled and how are they going to let those of us who are interested in talking with them the, the, um, the details are going to come work worked out later that's what I can tell you right now they, the ideas start with the council members and some key staff and then we'll expand it from there um, when I talk to myself, I'll probably have a better idea, <laughs> okay. right? That is the best answer I got for you right now. And thank you for the coffee. That is really a great outreach. Tool. Oh, the coffee with the mayor? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I got three more scheduled over the summer. And and that's the other thing um, I'll add is that I those are it. they were in the currents and so forth. It is a great opportunity. Tell some of your neighbors that they can come and. You know, for the most part, we've had some nice, good, civil conversations. <laughs> Everybody's passionate, but uh, for the most part, it's been, been nice that way. You know, yeah, don't bite my head off, man. <laughs> <laughs>
Tuesday is uh, the police chief candidates meet and greet. So you're 530, the address, the uh, Des Moines Activity Center there. Um, we hope to see all of you there and, um, and encourage other people to join as well, right? Open to the public, encourage them to come. And then uh, we will be, Bonnie will be getting a roster out to you and then we'll pro she'll probably be doing a poll for the next meeting to try to see how many, you know, what yeah. date we can capture the most of you at. Um, and then, yeah, uh, if you could do your homework assignment, that'd be great. Yeah. One thing I'll add is that, you know, during the summer, it's always tough to get everybody here. If particularly your alternate, you at the primary and the alternate, be here if you can. Obviously, they're going to be recorded, so I'd encourage you, if you do miss it, at least watch the meeting so you understand what the discussion was. But uh, they they should become your best friend so you can cover for each other. You could work together on, on different aspects. And I, I would say that if you and your alternate are not able to attend the meeting, if you have your six items, your three and your three, um, you know, I would say send it in to Bonnie and we'll make sure that it's captured in the meeting. Of course, we'd rather have you here and talk through those items, but if you can't make it, we still wanna make sure your information's captured, so send it in. Um, Thank you guys for your yeah, time. We thank really, you so much. really appreciate it. Now this meeting will be available on the city's website. Yeah. On the city's website. Yeah. yeah. Thank you.